Right, good morning, everybody. It's Paul Clegg from Somerset Marketing Hub Online. And this week's session is going to be all about sales. We've talked in the past about um, reaching and defining an audience and reaching out and getting in front of that audience. We've talked about engagement that lead that adds value and then leads to a uh, an opportunity to get in front of those person and sell them stuff whether it's a product or a service um, and whether that's online or offline we've talked a lot about uh, the delivery of that service and wowing people giving them something extra it doesn't need to be expensive but demonstrating that we love that particular customer by uh, some sort of surprise to them that makes them say wow and helps them remember. We've also talked about uh, then forming maybe joint partnerships, maybe referral circles and uh, making sure that we we at least ask for referrals and testimonials. But one of the subjects we haven't talked about in depth is sales and I want to do that today. I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible because if we're talking about sales we can be talking for hours. Um, and I guess on here, we've got some people that love sales, some people may be a bit reluctant. In my experience, because um, my background uh, started in sales, it still, I guess, is in sales and marketing. Um, but in my experience, a lot of people in business fight shy of sales. They misunderstand it, they fight away from it, they're reluctant to engage with it. Uh, and maybe but they're puzzled by it. So I hope that this particular session will at least take back the curtains of some of the myths about sales itself. I covered last week some of the rules of sales and it's not about selling people stuff they don't want. Sales, your job is to help your prospect make the best decision for them in solving the problems that they have. And right now, there's a lot more people who have got a lot more problems. And I think understanding those problems and having the mindset to help set, solve those problems um, and so that they make the best decision. And sometimes the best decision is to delay. Uh, sometimes the best decision you're not going to be able to provide. So you may want to pass them on to somebody else or just tell them they're not in a position to help them. The second rule, uh, and again, we covered this last week, is what's best for them is almost always outside of their comfort zone because if it was inside their comfort zone that have tattled it by now. And the third rule is, and it's fairly obvious, the prospect will fight like hell to stay inside of their comfort zone because it's comfortable. Uh, and yet we all know uh, that real growth is outside of a comfort zone. And I, I reckon that Mark has been engaging in a number of things that are outside his comfort zone, but he's meeting them head on and he's stretching his comfort zone. and. I think that in you know 12 months time, uh, he very well could be the accountant to go to because he's not frightened of things that his clients may be frightened of. Now there's two reasons uh, people buy. They're compelled to a better future in some uh, form of their life. In other words, where they are now is not where they want to be. So they envisage a future or maybe they don't envisage it maybe we need to point out how that future could be beneficial um, and the other thing very often we don't cover is the fact that being stuck in the situation we are right are right now is costly and doing nothing is going to continue to cost them um, i think for andrew on here um, and you and kelly if you're talking to people about a website that will give them more attention, that will give more explanation, give them more authority, the sooner you get that and the sooner you en get, they engage in a pay-per-click uh, program or a uh, SEO program for down the road and get people in front of that website, the sooner they're going to start getting inquiries and the sooner they're going to start doing business. And if we can identify what that business is going to be worth, staying where you are and putting that decision off is a costly one. There is a cost to doing nothing. And I think that we very often need to point that out to people. Uh, we don't point it out because we don't even ascertain what that cost is. Now, there's one golden rule, and we need to know this, and I've seen it so many times at BNI meetings, that when you're in front of uh, people proposing a solution, one of the hidden things is that the person that you're in front of needs to believe 
that you are the person to take them there. I need to believe that. That means they need to be confident that you have the solution, that you know what you're talking about. And there's sometimes, and I'll cover this in a moment, there's some things that will happen that will give hidden signals to maybe cause doubt that you are the person. Now, you can't begin a presentation or a dialogue with somebody where you're hoping to solve their problems until you know what those problems are, until you've engaged with them. So the key to all sales is research. The key to all sales is questions. And I didn't realize that when I first started out in sales, when I was calling on hairdressing salons. As a non-hairdresser, I was a little bit aware of that. I was also uh, I was aware of my age and the fact that I, I didn't have that level of experience. And I was petrified of questions. If they asked me a question I couldn't answer, particularly a technical question. Goodness me, I would absolutely blush and fold. And I think that um, that held me back for quite a while. I just relied on sheer perseverance uh, and bloody mindedness, I suppose. Uh, it was only when I became an area sales manager when I used to have to accompany colleagues and stand back from the conversation could I see the whole picture. And that was genuinely the case. You very often the person would uh, you could see from the other person's body language, which I wasn't noticing when I was in front of somebody and nervous. And if anybody's felt like that, you'll know what I mean. So. If the person you're selling to doesn't believe that you believe in what you are selling, you're batting off the back foot. These are some of the things that can cause that. First of all, language. If, uh, if we're dealing with somebody in a different marketplace than we're familiar with, the words that they use, the, the colloquialisms, the, uh, the tenure of the conversations, is normally peculiar to that marketplace. IT people have a conversation that leads me absolutely, goes right over my head. Uh, in fairness, accountants can do that. Lawyers can do that. But marketing people, people that are engaged in creativity, that is so comfortable. So if we're dealing with people that we are the way we're familiar with the market, then that is an advantage. If we're not, we need, do need to research that. And um, body language, when we're in front of people can also be really key. That is why I've got a, a, um, a tie and a jacket on today. Um, and it's really to indicate, and three people as we were prepared, as, as people were coming on board, remarked on that. And all I would say with this is, we've moved into an era where we're working from home and we can get by uh, in our pajamas all day, as long as it's below the Zoom, uh, uh, the Zoom uh, lens. But as we become, as we start to reach out, it's very important to think about how we appear. I was always mindful of that when I was going to B and I meetings, because invariably there'd be a mixture of uh, trades people that are maybe going on to paint somebody's house or electricians, etc. And I have no issue at all with how everybody it is, but it needs to match. Uh, if a painter and decorator came in a suit, what image would we have? What 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 would we what what would we form in the way of an opinion? He'd be the managing director, wouldn't he? Directing the flow of traffic. Absolutely spot on. Here's a guy that actually runs a group of painters and decorators. Um, so, body, so uh, the language you use is important, and the appearance is important. So you need to match that. And uh, I would invariably uh, used to be in a business suit where in the early days. I'm transitioned a bit as fashion changed to still be in a suit. I would always wear a jacket uh, and then maybe with a, an open neck shirt. But uh, that's that's an indication. So I'm not saying how anybody should dress. I'm saying that the person that's looking at you, just like the three people that commented, will form an opinion uh, as to who you are and how competent you are. And in many cases, I think we need to dress up. That's just my personal thing. You don't have to be stiff and starchy, but that's an opinion. Um, the third thing about uh, body language is enthusiastic. Uh, and I've seen so many cases uh, where I'm not sure whether the person believes in their product or service or even in what they're doing, because 
They, you may have an enthusiasm and a passion inside, but you need to show your face. You need to actually create the energy that you are excited about something. Now, that doesn't mean to say you've got to go over the top and become a joke. Um, in fact, you've got a temper humor I always find uh, when I'm dealing with people because I don't know how they're going to react. But we certainly do need to um, uh, show a, a certainty because people will follow certainty that we know what we're doing and the solution we're providing is one that is going to work. Um, and um, finally, in when we're talking with people, um, the key is to focus, and we've talked about this before, on afters. In other words, not about what we do, but what their afters, what they desire in terms of afters. What is the result they require? What is the result they desire? And talk a lot about that and how it's going to feel and really work it through. And I've always found one of, probably one of my uh, uh, reasons for success in the early days is that I do show a lot of empathy. I do try and understand where the other person is is, is sitting. Uh, afters for those people who are looking at this on replay are that, that people buy what they are left with after you have done what you do. And that is really key. They're not interested in what you do. Um, and sometimes people don't buy. But no doesn't necessarily mean no forever. And when we're in a selling situation, even from a sales background, no is the dreaded word. Because if you're really involved, it's easy to take that personally. I think the best advice that I can give to anybody is no is as a situation right now. It's no, it's not a no that you're not acceptable, that you're not a good person. It doesn't detract from your competency. No is just not right now. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you will be able to turn them around and hound them, not at all. But timing is one of the elements that is one of the biggest elements in any decision that people make to buy. Is the timing right now ready? Is the problem or the solution urgent enough? Do they know enough about you to make that decision to go with you? Timing is absolutely critical. And very often the timing is not right. And very often, the, if you've impressed that person, you've engaged with that person, that person may be ready to buy in the future when they've got a bit more information, but you've already started a relationship with them. Remember, 87% of, of sales take place after the seventh touch. And the sad thing is people don't make those touches. They don't follow up because they take no personally and they don't know how to follow up. Now, I think I've mentioned uh, a few weeks ago that I've started to use a very simplified CRM system to make sure I follow up and I stay in touch. And I have to tell you, I really would urge you to take a look at one CRM. Um, because for most people in business, they don't need big, sophisticated CRM systems. One CRM works on one principle that if I say I'll do something, I've got a meeting with somebody and I've done this with Andrew, um, you know, a Zoom call with Andrew. Uh, on such and such a date. And then when I click it as done, I can't forget it. It asks me what the next action is. It immediately pops up, what is the next action? So it's forcing me to think, where do I go from here with Andrew? Do, did I promise to do something? Did I promise to send him anything? Did I promise to invite him? And it, and it really does focus on that, uh, that next action. That can be a good tip in helping you follow up. There is another one. If you wanna look at uh, uh, one CRM, uh, go to paulclegg.uk forward slash stay in touch, all one word, paulclegg.uk forward slash stay in touch. And it'll show you a little bit about that. And you can go and get a free trial or whatever. There is another one called close.com, which is a great sales resource. If I wasn't using one CRM, I think I would be using close.com because it does tend to feature that next action bit. And I have to say, even if you go on there and download some of their sales booklets and tips, uh, which are free to download. They are really good. That'll really uh, 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 be an eye opener, including selling on um, uh, video calls, etc. The other thing I think we need to to look for. And this is advice from a sales. Find a way to use visuals in your demonstration. Your sales conversation is a communication process. And we're using body language, we're using words, we're listening, that is really key.
But the more that you can show people what you're talking about, the better. So before and after images um, and uh, are really key. Videos are actually quite quite compelling, and you may be able to show that in a in a uh, uh, in a demonstration in front of somebody on an iPad or a phone, or you may want to send that afterwards or before. Uh, so think visually in your communication because it will help your communication and it will help your prospects see where they are now and where they could be. And I've mentioned this before at BNI meetings and other networking meetings, and people say, ah, but you know, I can't show what I do. Stories are visual. If you include stories, where is the visual part of a story? You're telling a story, and from the moment you're explaining that story, the visual is in their head. They can feel, and if it's an emotional story, they can feel part of it. They can feel the pain. They can feel the elation. So stories are really, really key. And the final part about getting people involved is to act, get, actually get people engaged. So if your uh, uh, situation like Zoisa, for instance, it involves equipment or movement, actually getting them involved and trying out positions and using equipment is quite key. I started my sales career in uh, retail menswear. And one of the key things we were taught to do, the minute somebody came in, well, not quite the minute you'd engage with that person, find out what they were interested in buying, is you'd get their jacket off. And I'd get the jacket off and said, I think you're about 44 long or 42 uh, me medium. I'd never say 42 short, um, but I'd take their jacket off and get them feeling the merchandise. Even if it, you know, I'd, I'd make a good guess, but that wasn't important. I, I wasn't interested in that. I was getting them involved in the sales process. Um, final tip on that is when you've actually got to the stage where they decide they want some help and you say, would you like some help with that? Um, and you deliver the, the cost and you actually close the sale. Once you've done that and ask them, um, you know, shall we get started? Shut up. The number of people that I've seen deliver a really good presentation, really engage with the person, then ask for the order and then they carry on talking. Whereas if you do it the other way around, that person has got to start the talking uh, and you've got to start the listening. Uh, I'm going to give you some sales, sales stats now and then I'm going to open it up for, for your contribution. Uh, one other thing when you're prospecting and you're reaching out to people and um, there are many, many people you can be reaching out to. The low hanging fruit are the customers that you already have and that you may be no longer in contact with or in contact with. They're the people to uh, go to. The other people to reach out are the people that already know you that maybe they haven't bought. And in both cases, you could find out how they're doing, what their circumstances are, um, and through the right word choice, ascertain whether they are uh, you know, interested in whatever you, you've got. Even if you went out and said, I, I'm just calling. Uh, I'm just calling to find out if there's any good fit for our new program or what we're doing right now. Uh, and that is what we do is we provide so and so. So does this in general sound interesting to you? Uh, and just finding out whether that person is a prospect. So remember, if there's people you already know and trust you, they're the low hanging fruit. The second people are the people you already know before you go out spending lots of money trying to speak to strangers. Um, and remember. Contact with those people may lead to you to a sale, but equally important, if you know how to ask, they may lead you to a referral or an introduction, especially if you've got a good relationship with. One thing that I learned very early on uh, is, and when people are going out in a sales process, they count the, they count the yeses. So they'll give themselves a target to get sort of three sales a day. And there's an interesting book out there, and, I, and I've read it, and it's an excellent book. I can't remember the author, but it's called Go for No. And that concept was to actually go for a number of no's. So if, out, if you get two sales in 10, you go for 10 calls. In other words, don't count the yeses. Count the activity that leads to the yeses. The challenge when you're going for uh, two sales is that when you've got two sales, you back off. Whereas you could be doing more, that third and fourth sale could be eight and nine. The other thing is, if you're going for the no's, if you're going for the activity, 
then at the end of the day, you've got control of doing that activity. If it's reaching out to three new people a day, you can control that. You can't control the sales you get. And so if you're only going for the yeses, you can be disappointed more than you are elated. And when you're dealing in sales process, it's a roller coaster. So you've got to protect that roller coaster. Um, your closing rate, the number of sales you've got depend on three things. First of all, who you're speaking to, how well you've qualified them in the first place. If you're talking to people that have no money and you're talking to people that uh, are not in your uh, in, in, in your framework for, for customers, then you're going to get nothing. So you've got to qualify people. You've got to know who you want to talk to. The second thing that influences it is your offer. Is your offer, does it represent good value for the people you're speaking to? Um, and the third thing is your sales skills, your communication skills. And just as I like, like I spoke to Mark, said to Mark uh, previously, you can improve all of those things. You can improve them. And so we needn't be frightened of no's and we needn't be frightened. I'm going to give you some figures. I'm going to give you something now that will be quite interesting. And then I'll open it up uh, if I can remember how to do that. One moment. Right. I think you can all see that. Um, I can't remember where I got this from. Oh, okay. no. I found this on the web for what does it represent good value for the people you're speaking to think as your sales. Hey, skills, Siri, stop. Skills and just the iPad on the side. <laughs> some big brothers listening. Here's some shocking sales statistics. Knowing them, there'll be a few eye openers. Let me get this out of the way. If you follow up with web leads within five minutes, you're nine times more likely to convert them. The best time to email prospects between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. The best time to cold call, if you're doing that, I hate it, I won't do it, is between 4 and 5 o'clock. The second best time is between 8 and 10 a.m. The worst times are 11 till 2. Thursday is the best day to prospect. Wednesday is the second best. Tuesday is the worst day. I've always found Mondays to avoid, but uh, you'll find your own way. Top sellers use LinkedIn six hours per week. That's interesting. That could be research, engagement, building relationships, finding prospects. In 2007, it took an average of 3.68 cold call attempts to reach a prospect. Today, it takes eight times. Hey, bearing in mind with the statistics I gave you earlier. The average salesperson only makes two attempts to reach a prospect. The average salesperson only makes two attempts at a follow-up, if that, in my experience. Only 2% of cold calls result in an appointment lesson, find new ways to reach decision makers. That's why I don't do cold calls. I can't cope with the emotional roller coaster of that. But having said that, there will be other people that enjoy that. So if cold calls is, are necessary, find people who enjoy doing that. In a typical firm with 100 to 500 employees, an average of seven people are involved in most buying decisions. What that says to me is be mindful of who is going to decide. It's not always the person they're speaking to. It could be that the, their, their partner um, at home uh, runs the purse strings. I've always found when I was talking to the owner of a hairdressing salon, very often it was this, a key stylist story uh, that would have the most influence. That's why you need to engage with them, have a good impression with everybody. The average salesperson makes eight dials an hour and prospects for 6.25 an hour to set one appointment. Again, we're not the average salesperson, uh, but again, they're at least measuring statistics. The early bird gets the worm. 50% of sales go to the first salesperson person to contact the prospect. In other words, we shouldn't be frightened of reaching out. Email marketing has a two times higher return on investment than cold calling, networking or trade shows. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, that maybe that's a reflection that people don't follow up after networking and they don't follow up after trade shows. And Rod will tell us about that. Nurtured leads make 47% larger purchases than non-nurtured leads. A nurtured lead is somebody where you've built a relationship. Visuals are processed 60,000 times faster in the brain than text. Lesson, use more visuals in your presentations. I noticed that that was in these slides, and it's interesting what I said earlier. 
After a presentation, 63% of attendees remember stories and only 5% remember statistics. Didn't notice that either. The most memorable part of a presentation is the last five minutes end with a bang. 80% <laughs> of sales require five follow-up calls after meeting. 44% of salespeople give up after one follow-up. Well, I say eight or five. I think it's whether it's five or seven, it's certainly a lot more than most people make. 91% of customers say they'd give referrals, but only 11% of salespeople actually ask for them. Now, that is fascinating. That is a real eye-opener. Um, and maybe if we just fix that one thing, it could very well be that our sales will increase. 70% of people make purchasing decisions to solve problems. 30% make decisions to gain something. And each year you'll lose 14% of your customers. So the lesson is you can never stop prospecting. For anybody that's interested, uh, I'll actually uh, give you a link to that, those particular slides. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to come back to the meeting, open up the conversation for everybody. So I hope you found that useful. It was a little bit more in depth and longer than I, I thought at first. But sales is so critically important for everybody that I hope you've got something from that. What I'd like to do is to open up the meeting by a show of hands about any additional tip, anything you've resonated with, anything you found working for you or indeed not working for you, because that could help the people on the call. Yes, Ewan, and then, then Zoisa. That was, really, that, that was really interesting, Paul. Thanks for that. Um, I think sales is one of those things. When you, when you say sales, for me, when I started my career, I was always afraid of it because I, I've categorized it as a thing. This thing is sales, where actually it's just part of doing business. It's part of your everyday, what you do. And the one thing that I think I've learned, and you, you pointed to it, but um, when I'm talking to a prospect or a customer, is that enthusiasm. But it's not only for me, it's not enthusiasm in what I do, it's enthusiasm for what they do. And I've always found that to be something. Now, that's just part, again, everyone says, well, that's just part of, of research and part of being engaged with what they what they do. But genuinely, I find if you're genuinely enthusiastic about what the, someone else does, people like talking about themselves, be enthusiastic and allow them to talk about what they do. That was always helped. I found that's always helped the process. This doesn't close the deal, but it helps the process. I think it, uh, people think the close is the words you use at the end. Actually, the close is contribu contributed to all along the conversation. And I think you've raised a very good point there. When we are engaged with people, when we're talking to people in and out of sales, being interested in the other person builds that relationship instead of just being interested in yourself and only talking about yourself. So that is a really key point, being genuinely interested. I don't think I could sell, people say, oh, sell uh, ice to uh, Eskimos or sand to the Arabs. I don't think I could, unless I believe in the, that this solution is right, unless I'm uh, really convinced, then I can't, I can't do that. You know, I wouldn't have any interest at all. So being in, you know, I'll be interested in the in the prospect and maybe interested in thinking who I can connect them with that I trust that can help solve that problem. But I think that's a, a really key thing. I think the other challenge that people have got is that I love the sales profession, but goodness me, it's done in a very bad way in many ways. I hate some of the sales techniques that people use. And I think that's where you get that fear from. You know, you get that old used car salesman syndrome. I think that's very unfair on good used car salesmen or even new car salesmen. Um, I think that is, is very, for, and, and you see these examples of people using pressure and hard pressure and try closing techniques and, you know, these way you're being techniqued, no way. I think when it comes to showing your enthusiasm, it's important that you show your level of enthusiasm. It doesn't mean to say that you're out of character and you're all over the place because that would not be uh, authentic. But it is a little bit of a stage, so you just need to very often, well, always, up your energy levels just a tad. It only takes a little bit. Uh, Zoe, so you had a, a question or, or a contribution. Yeah, so um, I think sales is an interesting one um, from my experience of having worked on cruise ships and 
um, and also in the um, retail industry, um, often there's targets behind the sales and it's the emphasis is on getting it. Um, and that's and it's taken me a while to kind of get my head around what works for me. And so none of that works for me. So um, I think passion, um, you've got to be passionate about what it is that you're um, talking about, and then that will come across. I feel that the other thing is you've got to come from um, your heart. That may sound weird, but if you're just talking from your head, then people get that they're not interested whereas if you're coming from again I guess experience and um, genuine you know it's something that you're passionate about that that comes across and the thing that assisted me in terms of that is my I see sales or my job is to inform and educate and if you're passionate um, about whatever it is you're talking about and you're informing, which means that you're having to listen to them to see, well, what information do I know about that subject, that thing that is going to help you to see the value of it and feel the value of it that I'm passionate about. And I think that those are key things. And if you're focused on that element, then I feel that the, the sales and that or the conversion comes with it and that's part of the engagement but if you just focus on the outcome and what can I get rather than what can I give that makes a huge impact as well absolutely um, as long as we bear in mind <clears throat> that if we leave the person with the problem where they are we're not best serving them so we need to re we need to really say you know can I help you with this shall we you know is this something you'd like to to do uh, or whatever words you use to actually ask for the order. Um, ask for the order is a bit, maybe that's the wrong terminology for some people, but we don't serve that person if they're trying to make a decision based on uh, being overly cautious or, or their cost. I mean, I've had a situation recently where I'm talking to somebody and I've actually helped map out what he, he needs to do. and. I know that if he does one of those things, and I've told him, I said, I can help you do that, but without the rest, it's not gonna work. You'd be spending money and you'd be wondering why it's not working. You, you really have got to do these things. Uh, and uh, that's coming from being genuine about knowing what he needs to do to solve the problems that he's got and to stop losing and leaking the money he's losing. So I think you've got the confidence to do that. Uh, I think sometimes but then that's, people... that's what you just said. So what you've done is you've informed them. This is what you need to know based on what you're telling me, what I've heard. I'm informing you and educating you that this, you know, here's the basics. To... So yeah. which is no, good. No, no, I'm agreeing with you, Zoe. Sir. <clears throat> I think yeah. one of the challenges that some of us do have, and I've been guilty of this, is the solution may cost far more than than we think they can afford. And very often this comes up. That, so that's why we we end up underselling our services to a point where we're just not profitable. We're not going to stay in business. Uh, and pricing, maybe we could cover something on pricing on another occasion. Pricing can be very difficult for the self-employed. But I learned a long time ago that what somebody's got in their budget or their purse is none of my business. I can't determine. and. We might think that X amount is so much, but if somebody wants something bad enough, they'll find a way to find the money. Um, you know, the the new 27-inch uh, IMAX to 2,200. I'm definitely not going to buy it, uh, but I'm very tempted to find it, find the money to do that. Uh, I was talking to Andrew uh, a couple of weeks ago about the web services he, provide, he provides, but he's got customers that, when we've talked about it, the website is one thing, but getting people to go onto that website is another. And maybe a more complete presentation at some point must be to educate people on that process, because otherwise they're going to get the website and wondering why it's not resulting in the phone ringing. Um, and, and maybe that's that will result in a higher cost, um, but then that's the reality. You know, if you're trying to deliver a result, are we trying to deliver a website? Or are we trying to deliver the results of that website? Um, 
Anybody else got any from their sales experience or uh, Rod? From my limited uh, knowledge of sales, <laughs> um, I suppose really what really opened uh, the uh, the, shone the light in for me was uh, when I when I left the army, I joined the Prue after a short stint in the factory and um, the Prue insurance company that used to knock on doors. I was the man for the proof. So, yes, I used to knock on doors, collect premiums weekly, fortnightly, monthly, and so on and so forth. But the important thing was the Prudential was linked with America. And the American chaps came over and trained some of us up. And we were the best salespeople in the district. And uh, and and they, the important thing that uh, the proof wanted to get across was a fact-finding sheet. So you would see part of a prospect that you probably called on for the last three years and you think you'd know everything about them, wouldn't you? But when you start filling in a fact find and you ask them the questions that are on the fact find, that little piece of information, you'll find stuff out you would never have known unless you asked the right questions. And so that particular process opened everything up for me because I didn't take for granted. I wasn't the oracle of their life far from in fact i was the guy that called on them for two minutes once a month once a week once a fortnight wherever it was and that completely doubled and quadrupled my sales yeah. and i do that to this day today so when i sat sit in front of a uh, a customer i don't actually need the sheet although i do when i'm dealing with a funeral because i do, <laughs> i need a tick sheet then but um uh, and I was with a couple yesterday, and, and the most important thing for uh, uh, if you don't understand, as you quite rightly said, is that what is it that, that they actually need? What, why are they doing this? Why do they need this funeral plan? What's it all about? Um, and they own their own house, and, and you know they're worried about the first person to die if they own their own house and they've got no money. So they're, they're asset rich and they're cash poor. So that leads you into, you know, what can they afford? And it's important that you know what they can afford because setting something up for someone that they can't afford is a, a, a quick route to disaster. Um, and um, never been in a rush. I wasn't in a rush. I'm never in a rush, actually, to be fair. I'm, I'm very happy to say the only time I'm in a rush is I get a phone call and I've got to go somewhere quite quickly for something else, you know. But um, and not in a rush and um, uh, making sure that, what they're doing, you're careful and professional enough to um, ensure that they're very happy with the cost, very happy with the conclusion, the problem solved. And then finally, don't forget, if you know anybody else in your own situation, same situation as you, I would love to speak to them. Oh, don't worry, they said to me yesterday. <laughs> We've already referred you to three people. And that's what it's all about, that ongoing situation as well. Actually, the best time to ask for a referral uh, actually is when they've had, when they've got that product or service and experienced it. Now, that's not easy uh, in that situation. Um, but uh, giving quality time to somebody. And actually, that tip, those questions are probably extending the, the questions that you would ask naturally. We all, you know, when we get into this, we ask certain questions and stop there. Um, but the more we, we more we delve in, we more we research, ask questions, look, the better. When I was calling on salons, there was no such thing as the internet. Nowadays, you're about to meet somebody. If they're not uh, if they're not researching you, you certainly can be researching them. You can be on LinkedIn. And the other thing about one CRM is that when that data comes in, you've got automatic links to their social media pages. So you can go onto their website see what their business is, see what questions you want to ask about that. You can go on LinkedIn, Facebook, and you can get a good picture of somebody before you actually meet them. So that is invaluable. Is it, you know, do people want to do that? Well, it depends how, how much the sale is and, and uh, from a value point of view and how much you, you want it. Then I'm going to bring it to a close because we've reached the top of the hour. Anybody else want to add any points? Um, and clearly not. So I'm going to go round. I just ask you to cover one thing you've got from this morning's meeting. So I'm going to start with Mark. I mean, for me, this this all resonated. I mean, I have a, a newfound respect for salespeople. Historically, it's always been accountants versus sales. But uh, having been through what I've been through this last 10 months, um, yeah, I've certainly got a newfound respect. Uh, certainly won't do cold calls because I hate receiving them. Uh, and yes, I do spend probably six hours a, a week on 
on LinkedIn. So uh, it's working for me and uh, I feel we're gaining traction. So uh, let's see where it goes. That's good. Uh, and actually, salespeople help you make the right decision. Remember that. So good salespeople stand out and you don't yeah. have to come from a sales background. If you're at, if your mindset, depending, it doesn't matter what your characteristic is to, to a degree, if your mindset is to really help people achieve and help them, then that is a, a good bedrock of being good at sales. All you might need to do is to think a little bit more about the, uh, the process and, um, and that, that whole communication process. Um, Andrew, what about you? Yeah, I think I think this conversation has really crystallised a few things for me. One of the things that I've sort of fallen over on in the past is where you sort of build a relationship with somebody and they're a client, and then you almost I always I've, I've noticed that I've, sometimes they sort of then move away, and it's because I've suddenly almost moved into the oh yeah you need this rather than being my normal self. It's like well obviously you've got a relationship and actually. It's a never-ending process. You always, you always have to be, you know, in the right voice and what have you, and coming at it from the right angle. I think rather than the, oh well, they'll obviously know that, but they don't. When you say move away, do you mean geographically or go to another supplier? Um, not necessarily go to another supplier, but um, I think that has happened actually. Yeah, that's that was that was an interesting. There was one incident where um, you know, got a really good relationship, had some really good feedback, and they were sort of on the cast. And then I sort of switched away from that mode and then went to somebody else. So that was a big learning point, actually. Did you find out why they went away? Um, I didn't, actually. And that's something I should definitely follow up on because I still in contact with those guys. So, yeah, that's, very, that's a very good point. <laughs> it could be nothing to do with your service or whatever. I mean, yeah, we, we will get natural attrition, but we suddenly think people have... have uh, uh, moved away because there's something wrong with us, and that's not the case. Uh, uh, Rod, what about you? Any closing remarks? Anything well, you've got from today? As you know, I co call every single week on a Wednesday. I'm co calling all the time. And um, part of my co calling is engaging with people, and it's surprising how um, it, it can make a difference if you were only to engage with the people that walk by or the people that you talk to in the shop, in the, wherever you are, there's always an opportunity to turn it, to turn it around on what you're doing or, or, or what, whatever it is, the product or service you're selling. And um, so we, we can have conversation. I bet you, if you were to ask anybody that knows me, they'd know I'm a funeral director. Ask yourself the question, everybody you know, do they know what you do for a living and do they know how you put the money in the bank every month? If they don't, then you're missing potential customers, potential referrals. You're talking um, about the go-to person. Yeah. It's called reputation. I'm not sure about turning somebody is quite, uh, that might give people the wrong impression, but the more you do engage with people and ask them questions and really actively listen, the more you see things that maybe you could help them with uh, or not. Uh, Kelly, you and just close remarks from yourself. Anything you've, you've resonated today? Uh, I think everything resonated. I think it was a really good session, and uh, you know, I still got a lot to learn about sales, but it was great to hear some of those insights. Um, and my last point would be, I just want to say fair respect to you, Mark, for everything that you're doing. And I'm really sorry I can't make the session next week, but I really hope it's very successful for you. Thanks very much. I I don't know whether even I've got a link for that, but I'll be delighted to uh, if I've got you know as long as it's not clashing with anything. What, what, what day is it? It's uh, 7th at 11 o'clock. In the morning? Yes. Right. So, it, so you haven't got made that leap to attract the uh, people from the west coast of America? Uh, no. I'll stick to the UK. Quite right. There's enough potential there. Guys, thank you very much in, uh, for today. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, Nick, uh, our photographer, uh, is on holiday, so he's going to be back with us next week. And uh, when I send these links out, please, by all means, you know, share it with other people if you think they're going to get some benefit. Okay. And if there's any particular subjects you'd like us to cover, uh, then please give us a shout out. Anything that's concerning you, then uh, there's no reason why we can't all get our heads together to help you on that. All the very best. See you soon.
Thanks, guys. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.